Let's move on to your other area um, of work, which is on the, the data generation process. Can you talk more about what you do there and uh, what questions you're asking or what data you're collecting and how, and how that works? Yeah, so this kind of dovetailed with some teaching we were doing. Uh, and I, I'll often tell my students, like whenever I introduce this project, it's like, uh, this could be a real career killer for me. Uh, because it was very much, uh, it's been a very much long-term data generating process. And we've had, we've done two different ones, right? The, uh, the most recent one is the rules data that I mentioned beforehand, where I'd be teaching a smaller class. Uh, the students would then go through the congressional record throughout the course of the class and basically grab the entire text of a special rule when it was used, basically dump it in an Excel file. And yeah, they'll classify it either as closed, open, structured, however, uh, and provide some additional information on it. Uh, but the, the strength, I think, of that project and the thing that always interested me in doing that one was we often get into so many debates within the literature over what constitutes a closed rule versus a structured rule versus an open rule because there are levels, right? Certain rules might say this bill is going to be open under these three clauses and closed under these two set titles, right? Uh, so I figured it would just be useful for us to, to provide the full text of these things you know, to the general public if they wanted them. And the other longer term project that uh, we're real close to being done with uh, was we've had such phenomenal data within political science on roll call votes. And you've seen, you know, if you follow vote view at all, right, uh, and Professor Poole's work on that area, uh, We've used these votes to classify members as being liberal, conservative, and being able to say things about the uh, how ideology has changed over time, right? Are members more responsive to constituents, less responsive? What impact has this rule had uh, in terms of policy outcomes using how members have voted on roll calls? Uh, <clears throat> but in graduate school, kind of stumbled on this point that, hey, not all votes are recorded. And in fact, the default voting mechanism in Congress is the voice vote, which is, you know, if you're ever accidentally flipping past C-SPAN and you'll see like the chair say something like, oh, po all in favor say aye, and a bunch of people go aye, I'll post say nay, nay, and then say like the ayes have it, right? I'm like, all right, well, how often does that come up? So after a couple of years of kind of screwing this question up, uh, we went out and grabbed, started grabbing data on all amendments to landmark pieces of legislation uh, using a couple of different definitions of landmark legislation uh, and trying to see like, all right, how, how common is it for a roll call to actually be generated? And one of the things we found and didn't necessarily surprise us is drastic increases in the likelihood of a roll call vote occurring in more recent Congresses. This, we have hypothesis, has, has had an effect on what we observe in terms of polarization, right? We often talk about this massive increase in ideological polarization. But if what we're seeing is a, in particular, rules votes being far more likely to get recorded votes uh, in the contemporary period than they were in the 40s, 30s, 20s, 1910s, something like that, right? Uh, then what you're getting is you're getting this massive increase in pure party line votes, right? So as beforehand in 1950, when it was extremely rare for a house rule to get a recorded vote, you'd have you know four or five, I, I don't really know off the top of my head how many pure party line votes on those things. And today you're getting 500 pure party line votes on those things, right? That's gonna make Congress look a lot more partisan just because the things that you're putting into your data were getting excluded. They were occurring in that period. They just weren't getting votes, right? Uh, and so we've been, I think now we, I think we collected something like 150,000 uh, amendments, uh, some of which we were able to, to scrape using uh, text uh, for the modern period. Uh, and, you know, the, we're hopefully going to be able to post that data online shortly uh, once we finish the book, which is nearly there. 
And so maybe you can't share the conclusions yet, but yeah. is the conclusion along the lines that you mentioned, which is that, you know, maybe this polarization has always been there. Or I should say that the current things that look like polarization are sort of par for the course for the last hundred years and it just wasn't recorded. Yeah, I wanna kind of qualify that a bit. Uh, the way we often word it is, there's uh, certainly some artificial polarization going on. I definitely think we're probably more polarized than we used to be, uh, but the gap between the parties isn't, uh, or at least within members in the parties or actually between the parties is probably not as steep as it used to be, right? Uh, the parties are still probably uh, pretty cohesive. Uh, the rank order of members we think is still probably about the same in terms of what, who the most liberal member is versus the most conservative member. But there's this artificial spread. Uh, and I don't think this alters the consequences of polarization, right? The, regardless if it's polarization is driven by a change in ideology or a change in electoral and institutional incentives or rules, as we often talk about, uh, or data generating processes, I think you're still going to get gridlock uh, and you're still going to get a slow moving Congress that's going to be fairly frustrating. But I do think it alters like the solution, right? Oftentimes when we talk about fixing Congress, people will talk about fixing Congress by throwing the bums out. But without fixing the way the institution is designed and the way the rules are designed and the way things get roll call votes, throwing the bums out and replacing them with less ideological members is just gonna lead to more bums, right? Those members are going to increasingly look as polarized as we've seen before. So this data collection that you've been doing, it's along the rules side of things, and then it was in the roll call votes. Those are the two big data projects that you have? Yeah, uh, we've also been grabbing data kind of related to the roll call vote on landmark pieces of legislation uh, and just additional information, like how long was this thing on the floor for, what committee did it go to, uh, kind of building off some of the data you'll see in Adler and Wilkerson's uh, stuff. So more like weaving the story, a real story around a particular piece of legislation rather than just the raw data of the votes and the rules. Exactly, because uh, you know, tracking substitute bills is a huge problem. And so for most of the data that we're seeing online is it's at the bill level, right? So S12 gets introduced, it passes the House, doesn't pass the Senate, something like that. Uh, whereas we're going through and we're kind of combining that with the sort of the Mayhew divided we govern approach and taking all of these bills, putting them into one piece of uh, legislation and actually tracking, all right, well, this bill was considered across four Congresses or this enactment was considered across four Congresses. It combines nine to 12 bills, however many, right? Uh, all of which received various levels of votes. Yeah, that's the problem with a lot of the congressional data is that sometimes it doesn't really give you a lot of insight into what's happening. Um, yeah, I was, uh, we had this come up where I had a student that was writing a legislative history on the uh, uh, Matthew Shepard hate crimes bill. Uh, and this is, this ha example comes up all the time. And she's like, there's no house debate on this. And like, well, there was house debate. The house debate was just on a different bill that they then folded into this on the Senate side. And it becomes really difficult to kind of track that. So that's the goal is to try and make this a little bit more a little bit easier to for the general public to follow. And, and you've had undergraduate students or, or uh, primarily focused on this data collection? Yeah, undergraduate students working with uh, faculty as well as a number of graduate students kind of supervising. Excellent. Yeah. Well, great. Well, let's move on to the uh, um, your other, I guess, work around the process and, and policy project. Can you talk about that? Yeah, it kind of stemmed, uh, came out of this uh, data collection project where, you know, it used to be I would give a student a bill and I would say, all right, grab all the amendments on this bill, put it in this data set. Uh, and then part of me thought, uh, is this, am I, am I being good at teaching here? Or are they just kind of uh, going in and grabbing data and dumping it in an Excel spreadsheet? Uh, and so inevitably it kind of evolved into, all right, well, write up a legislative history. Tell me the story of this piece of legislation. Um, and that was 
kind of eye-opening for me because students really like doing that. Normally when I teach students, again, I, I mentioned this about legislative procedure, uh, it turns out they don't want to learn about legislative procedure, but they care about substance, uh, which you know was not really my area, but I was like, yeah, all right, fantastic. And I've had uh, increasingly a number of students at Georgia that have been dual majoring. So they come in because they care about ag policy with a minor in political science or environmental policy uh, or something to that effect. And I'll be able to pitch them on a piece of legislation about a topic that they care about. Uh, and they will then write up the history well, coding some data and tell me like, all right, well, here's why this bill was brought to the floor. Here's what happened in previous Congresses on this topic. Uh, here's what was really controversial about it. And oftentimes we find that the thing we talk about today as being the most controversial aspect of this bill uh, was not something that came up at all during the debate. Uh, either it came into the bill afterwards through a bureaucratic rule or judicial decision, something like that, or you know, it's just something they hadn't given a ton of thought to, right? Uh, one of the more recent, uh, we had this one a few years ago where a student wrote up the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 86. And when people think about that bill, they think about the crack versus cocaine disparity in sentencing, which set it at like 20 to one, right? The same amount of crack was 20 times longer sentence than the same amount of cocaine, right? And that had massive racial implications and was generally viewed as a, as a bad provision. Uh, and when you go through the debate on that, it's abundantly clear there was no debate on that. That was something they tossed into the bill uh, upon consulting with a couple of who they thought were experts, but actually weren't in committee. And a number of staffers immediately after the bill passed were like, whoa, this turns out to be a disaster. We need to change that. And they were never able to change that for something like 20 years because, you know, you're going to look weak on crime. So the goal was for a student to kind of write those things up. And we have this website called the Congress Project where uh, we've been very slowly posting these things so that the general public, if they want to get some of the background on, you know, why does Major League Baseball have a uh, uh, antitrust exemption, right? We'll be able to kind of post that story and tell them. Fantastic. And that, so that's also an undergraduate set of work. Yeah, undergraduate work, although I've had a bunch of my graduate students working on this as well. Uh, and it tends to get fairly heavily edited, usually over the course of several semesters by both other undergraduates and faculty. Well, good. Well, you know, maybe we can move on to what we call our lightning round, which is uh, questions sure. we ask all of our guests and ultimately can compare the answers. Yeah, um, so you ready for that? Yeah, roll. All right. The first one is, what do you think congressional representation should mean? Damn, that's a good question. It's supposed to be the lightning round, huh? Um, you know, it's something I kind of go back and forth on, to be honest with you. And it's something I've talked to. It's been a point of debate among scholars for a while. And I'll admit, I do not have like a great answer. And more specifically, what I, we often debate is, do we like the idea of individual members being able to kind of buck the party and being able to respond directly to their constituency? Uh, or is it just easier to have congressional representation essentially be partisan representation, right? And there are clear advantages and disadvantages to both, right? One of the things I like about, you know, some of the models are adopted in other countries is, you know, when the party doesn't pass something, you know who to blame. You're a representative who's in the party and you vote for the guy in the other party to replace that person. When members are able to kind of position themselves as being independent and being able to, you know, more, directly speak to their constituency, that's nice in the sense that, you know, they can get at local issues fairly well, but it also kind of muddles the water in terms of, all right, you know, is it my member, is my member the problem in terms of why we didn't pass healthcare reform or whatever it is that uh, people care about? Um, <clears throat> I would say that uh, gun to my head, I probably lean towards uh, partisan representation and just kind of simplifying the whole system. I think uh, the way the system's designed now is we ask an awful lot of voters in terms of being able to delineate their members' position on a host of different micro level issues. Uh, and I think some of these problems would be solved with a simplifying broad party queue. Uh, 
but I would also not be surprised if I was dead wrong about that. So, you know, it's interesting because of your interest in rules, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you've got a constituency and a majority votes for someone who's subject to external rules than from their own judgment. Basically, they're not voted on their judgment. They're voted on their adherence to an external set of rules. And that's what you think is a better option than what we've got? Ah, I would also add that simplifying those rules would make that uh, easier, right? To be able to call them uh, out on that. Uh, I often think that members will use rules in a way that kind of muddies, further muddies accountability, right? So senators will get elected by making promises that they know their party has no intention of keeping and then blame it on the filibuster and say, well, we would have liked to have reformed immigration, but filibuster doesn't, doesn't let us do that. Uh, or there's actually a really good, so I mentioned the Boehner, has got a book coming out. I read the Politico excerpt and he was complaining about uh, uh, Michelle Bachman and how she wanted to get appointed to this committee and how she threatened basically hammering him on Fox News if she didn't get it. And he was like, well, she was right. Uh, even though it's not my call, it's the Republican steering committee's call, right? She was not going to mention the intricacies of Republican steering committee uh, you know, debate, right? Uh, when she went on Fox, she was just going to kind of hammer me with that. Uh, so yeah, I, I think you're right uh, in terms of we need to massively simplify those external rules or those rules. Uh, and then basically be able to say, all right, well, you know, the party has the ability to control the rules. Uh, and if they're not passing this bill, it's because they either didn't have a majority for it or you know, just didn't want to do it. And I think oftentimes the case is they didn't want to do it. Got it. And so also in that case, it's quite a, your view of representation is very majoritarian in terms of the district, right? If 51% votes a votes a votes a creed that creeds implemented a hundred percent and so the, the 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 minority is you you have quite a majoritarian view of representation yeah i don't know that uh, i think so right but even if you simplified the rules and made members kind of accountable to the party the u.s still has a system where it's bicameral uh, and you're going to get disagreements between the house and the senate it still has a system where you have an executive branch that's elected separately and that executive branch is gonna disagree a bit. Uh, you still have a court system, uh, and then you have state governments, right, uh, that are also going to step into the policymaking process. And I'm not 100%, I can't say with great confidence if I would be as pro-majoritarian without that heavy level of separation of powers that already exists in the US. Uh, although part of me thinks, yeah, maybe that's the answer, I guess. Got it. All right. Well, my yeah. next question is, uh, how would your ideal Congress allocate its time? That's a great question. Yeah, I mean, ideally, I, I think debating policy would be near the top of that list. Um, what, what about D.C. versus the home district? Yeah, uh, so I, I do think you're always going to get uh, a certain level of constituent service. Although, you know, having spent time state legislative bodies doing constituent service work, that always seemed like something that could be taken a, or, or done in a nonpartisan or non even district based way. Um, a lot of times these are calls like, hey, can you help me deal with the Social Security Administration? Uh, you know, can you uh, help me deal with uh, a small business association, something like that. Uh, and to the extent, yeah, it, it is nice having members who can, who know the district or staffers more so, uh, who really know the district and can get to, get to those questions. You know, having a, a support agency kind of geared specifically for those might be even more useful or more effective right and it would make sense with your if if you think that the district's voting for party then constituent services loses its relevancy in any case yeah and i do kind of think in recent years we've seen constituent service kind of 
I don't want to say slack off because there's still a certain uh, large amount going into it. Uh, but I just don't know how much that plays in terms of campaigns anymore. So it sounds like then you'd increase their time in Washington at the expense of the district. Oh, yeah, certainly. Uh, I would certainly be pro increasing time in Washington at the expense of, uh, of the district. Uh, but again, that's provided you could do something about the charge that the member has gone Washington or something to that effect. We've done some work on legislative staffing. And you've seen this massive decrease in legislating staffing resources to individual member offices over the last 40 years. Uh, and to the extent they are getting resources, they're spending it primarily on media-based staff. Uh, so bulking that up and giving members more resources to kind of compete with the executive branch or to compete with the uh, judicial branch, right, in terms of policy authority uh, would be kind of one way to go. Assuming that we have the existing system we have today and you can yeah. just tweak the time somewhat, right, yeah. of, the, of, of congressional time, it sounds like you'd bias it more towards in Washington focused on, you know, legislative and oversight work. What about that balance between legislative and oversight? Do you have any sense for where that is today and where <coughs> it could be? It'd be nice if we could figure out a way to kind of departisan the way oversight operates. Uh, because it really is a, well, they're going to do a ton of oversight when the other party has the executive branch and very little oversight when the other party doesn't have the executive branch. Uh, but I do think increasingly making more, spending more time doing oversight makes sense just because increasingly we've seen Congress delegate more and more of its authority uh, to the bureaucracy or independent regulatory agencies and boards. Um, so you know, I don't know the exact ratio I would put it at just because I don't really know the exact ratio of uh, policy authority in the bureaucracy versus the legislature, but I do think uh, it's certainly important to do both. Great. Next question is, how should debate, deliberation, or dialogue occur or be structured in Congress? Yeah, so uh, again, I, I think it'd be nice to to have more of that, um, especially at the committee stage. Uh, I know this has been kind of a push within, or we've seen scholars talk about how it'd be nice to go back to regular order where you had, you know, lengthy debates about policy on the floor. Uh, in my view, the floor tends to be a bit overrated. Uh, I think it's probably more important to see this done at the committee stage than, than actually at the floor stage. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to see more debate, discussion within committee, among committee members, certainly less of the let's write a bill two days before sending it to committee than getting it on the floor because we don't want to give interest groups time to kind of pick it apart. Uh, and we have seen, I think, that approach increasingly used lately. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd like to see more of that at the committee stage. I, despite the fact that members and scholars often complain about the lack of floor amending, I don't know that floor amendments are particularly healthy for policymaking, uh, at least in comparison to committee amendments, right? I, I think the floor is where you get a lot more kind of gotcha policy amendments or uh, log rolling type amendments. And in this, um, in this committee environment where you think there should be more debate dialogue, you know, there's the question of whether it should be with cameras on or whether it should be private, um, this transparency versus privacy argument and where you're going to get real discussion or compromise. Any thoughts on that? I mean, I, I think it really kind of depends on how far you want to go with this. Uh, certainly in our current environment now, cameras off is conducive to, or always feels like it's more conducive to deal making. Uh, the question is just how much can we rely today on actually the cameras being off? It feels like any kind of informal negotiation is getting late. Uh, that's something, you know, we've done work on the move to recorded voting in the Committee of the Whole in the 70s. And one of the points that people make during that is, yeah, people were voting anonymously, on key provisions in the early 70s before they were being put on the record. But towards the end, 
their votes were being leaked to the general public through people in the gallery saying, yeah, I see whoever voting yes or no. Uh, so I, I'm very sympathetic to the idea that less transparency might be a good thing uh, and that today we're essentially drowning in transparency, right? Every committee report is put online and it's impossible for the general public to, to follow this because you're just in a pure information overload situation. And really the only people that have the ability to track this are interest groups with, with the, the money and resources. I'm just a little bit skeptical that, you know, going anonymous is going to, or kind of closing the doors is gonna to lead to less information and, or less information getting back to the public that, you know, members don't want to, don't want to get back to the public. Yeah, I think we, uh, in a previous discussion with uh, Representative Rodney Davis, mm -hmm. I asked him this question and he mentioned that, I was like, do you think it would be better if the cameras weren't on? And he said, the cameras are never going, never going off. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Just we're kind of in that period where, you know, there isn't just some scribe writing with a quill pen, right? There is tons of information out there uh, and it's a matter of, your choice is more information overload versus information that's getting intentionally leaked as opposed to information overload versus, you know, behind the scenes negotiations. Next question is, uh, what fundamental institutional improvement should Congress make within 50 years? So I'm biased given my area, but uh, I would love to see simplicity. Um, at a minimum, I think one of the things that makes it very difficult for the public to like or care about Congress uh, is that, you know, it isn't necessarily that they're turned off by the sausage making process. I'm sure they are. Uh, but it's that the sausage making process is so complicated, it's impossible for them to follow what's going on. Uh, and it's, you know, I've, I've been in a couple of discussions about this. It isn't a matter that I think the public needs to understand everything that's happening in Congress. But simplifying things so that you or me or whoever can explain things to people, right? Uh, as opposed to, you know, you pull up an article about how this bill became a law and they'll talk about, you know, there are three votes here, but these are procedural votes. And there'll be no other additional information, even though those three votes might have had a big impact on policy. You know, it always comes up when I feel like people watch Congress basically twice a year uh, for whatever big bill and they'll ask, like, what's this vote? Are they voting on the bill? And as a scholar, you have to try and explain to them what a vote on a, ordering the previous question motion on a martial law rule is. And you can just immediately see people tuning out, right? Uh, these recent decisions by the parliamentarian's office kind of opening up uh, to multiple reconciliation, I think is gonna make uh, the Senate more majoritarian, certainly, but it's also gonna make it nearly impossible to explain. Like, why is this bill allowed to go through reconciliation versus these other four bills. And it, it's just, it, it's tough to tell people. And because it's tough to tell people and explain to people, I, I think people just are tuning out. Uh, and I also think there are a bunch of rules that are just frankly needless that you know aren't helping Congress by any means. They're just kind of rules that have been stacked on top of rules on top of rules. So any particular focused rule changes that you would make that would you think would have a big impact? Yeah, I mean, I think kind of doing away with the motion to recommit as they did essentially at the start of this Congress was helpful. Uh, I would, uh, certainly the martial law rules seem needless. Like just alter your rules to, to get rid of the one day layover or two day layovers or however you want to do that. Uh, I don't think you need to be taking recorded votes on previous question motions. How Congress hasn't gotten rid of that yet is beyond me because those votes are always used in primaries against sitting members, right? They're not used by the minority party. They're used like to hammer, if it's a Republican, by another Republican in a primary. You know, you'll see that ad with them in all black and white, like he voted 12 times to raise his own pay, all right? And inevitably, they're bullshit previous question motion votes that people are kind of hammering them on. Uh, so, you know, I think those are all kind of starts. I think there are a number of procedural motions that you shouldn't have to be taken recorded votes on. All right. N next question is, uh, what book or article most shaped your thinking with respect to congressional reform? 
That's a good question. I'm trying to think about that. Uh, my favorite article on rules is Gary Cox's 2000 piece on uh, on special rules. Sarah Bender's majority rights, uh, minority or minority rights majority rule book, I think would be probably near the top of that as well. Um, my advisor, Steve Smith, uh, Call to Order, I think was a great book and certainly is kind of uh, always in the back of my head uh, in terms of how to think about this. Great. Well, the last question is just about, you know, your own research and plans. You know, obviously you've got your several areas of work. What do you see in the next five, 10 years of your career and where are you going to take this research? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, we have a draft of our book on recorded voting and uh, hopefully that'll be out uh, this summer. I will be submitting that to publishers. Uh, then we have uh, the rules committee uh, or the special rules data, which is just available online. Uh, and you know, once the book is out, I'm hoping to make a bigger push on the Congress project, uh, which is you know, a little bit less scholarly, but the general premise of making this stuff accessible to the general public is something I would like to do. Uh, just like we've, we've made the data a little bit more accessible so people can kind of pull that off. I'd like students to, or people to be able to go to the website when there is a question of like, hey, why does this policy exist the way it is? You could pull up a legislative history. Uh, and <clears throat> you know, one of the things I like people taking away from that is we link a bunch of articles they can go to for further reading. So even if you're a little skeptical of somebody's write up on the how this bill becomes a law, uh, you can go figure out where to track it down for additional information uh, and where to go to find additional information and articles, books, however. Well, great. Thank you uh, much for the time, Tony. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, no, absolutely, Matthew. And good luck with everything. Keep me posted and let me know if you have any questions. Same to you. Take yeah, care. See you.